All right, ladies and gentlemen, we have longtime NFL insider, the great, the intrepid, uh, the venerable Mr. Peter King. Welcome, sir. Thank you for joining me. Hey, no problem, William. Happy to be on with you and uh, look forward to it. Really appreciate it. I wanted to discuss these quarterbacks, and I want to start with Deshaun Watson. And not necessarily his legal matters, but his contract. Back in March, he signed a five-year deal for $230 million, fully guaranteed. Uh, Prior to that, the most guaranteed money the NFL had handed out was Aaron Rodgers at $150 million. Can you help us understand just how miffed other owners and executives were by this Deshaun Watson, Cleveland Browns contract? Well, to understand that, you have to understand why anybody would care what a quarterback is paid and how the contract is structured. And in the NFL, there is this funding rule that says if a team guarantees X amount of dollars in that contract, that number or that X amount of dollars has to be put in escrow with the league office. So if you pay a guy a contract that is $230 million guaranteed, you don't actually have to put that amount of money in escrow. You've got to put that minus the first year because theoretically the NFL feels that if you have guaranteed the money and you've already paid him a huge bonus in the first year, that first year is covered. But basically years two through five have to go into escrow. And, you know, whatever that number is, $180 million or whatever, Cleveland owner Jimmy Haslam and his wife, Dee Haslam, who co-owned the franchise, had to put $180 million bucks somewhere in that vicinity into an account at the league office. So they you have to be fairly liquid. Now, NFL owners are all wealthy. We all know that. <laughs> but, but some... Uh, The wealth for Stan Kroenke, who uh, is one of the uh, married to Walmart heir and who's independently wealthy himself and Jerry Jones, those people, they have the kind of wealth that they can take one hundred and eighty million dollars and they can put it away. Whereas the next two uh, teams, let's take Lamar Jackson out of the equation, but the next two teams with young quarterbacks who are going to have to be paid are both owned by people who own family businesses. And uh, Mike Brown in Cincinnati with Joe Burrow, Justin Herbert Mm -hmm. with the Chargers, with the Spanos family. Those people don't have $180 million in the couch cushions (laughs) that they can just uh, pull out. That's why a lot of people in the NFL were upset. The other reason is, as time has passed, uh, it's become apparent that they did not have to do this. The Browns, they didn't have to do this. They weren't being held hostage by Deshaun Watson's agent, right. you know, to do this. They did it because they wanted to show their level of commitment to Deshaun Watson. Add all those things together, and that's why a lot of people in the NFL are not happy with uh, the Haslam's. Mr. King, they they set the quarterback market up pretty high. As I mentioned, prior to Deshaun Watson's $230 million, the most guaranteed dollars given out was $150 to Aaron Rodgers by the Green Bay Packers. Once this number is out, is there anything the owners can do to kind of reset the market and, and, and bring it back down? Very uh, much. I mean, what they can do is they can, and I can tell you that they're, are quarterbacks who have to get done like you know Lamar Jackson and the two aforementioned people and I think what's happening is that the teams that have to get something done are claiming that this is a uh, uh, that that contract is an outlier Mm -hmm. and uh, the the Deshaun Watson contract is only one contract now since it happened Excuse me, since it happened, um, the Derek Carr contract got done, and that was done for far less guaranteed money than Watson. 
uh, other mega contracts have gotten done that have been done for far less guaranteed money than Watson. So I don't, I don't really think that Mike Brown and Dean Spanos are going to have to totally guarantee the contracts for their quarterbacks. The only reason that they would have to do that, honestly, is if those guys want out. Mm -hmm. And if then they insist that if we don't get a fully guaranteed contract, you franchise us a couple of years and then we're not re-signing here long term. And so they could do that, but I doubt that that's going to happen. I think that the contracts will get done probably for less guaranteed money than we now know. Yes, yes. And it's been amazing to watch because once I saw Deshaun Watson, I thought that was the new market. But it seems like the owners in the NFL have been able to kind of bring it back down to earth. As you mentioned, Derek Carr was done for far less guaranteed dollars, and so was Kyler Murray. Yep. With, Desh- with uh, excuse me, Lamar Jackson, you mentioned him a few times. His contract is coming up. Uh, but this time last year, he mentioned like he was kind of too focused on football to worry about his contract. And yeah. right now, it's interesting because I'm trying to understand the level of urgency on the side of both parties, both Lamar Jackson and the Baltimore Ravens. Can you help us get an idea of like the level of urgency on the, on both sides? I, I don't I don't know. I don't really know a lot about what's going on there, William. I I have not covered it day to day, but my impression from afar is that the Ravens were never really in any hurry to get Deshaun Watson done. They thought that if Watson, I mean, Deshaun Watson, if, uh, if, if, if Lamar Jackson, they weren't in any hurry to get Lamar Jackson done. The reason that they weren't is that there was a little bit of a pockmark in the Lamar Jackson resume. Okay. Lamar Jackson has been excellent in the regular season. He's a 37 and 12, his record uh, and all that. But last year he got hurt. He was not fully healthy. uh, And it was hard to judge him. You know, he was okay last year, but he was in and out of the lineup and, and didn't play late and all that. And so, And then the fact that they couldn't win games without Lamar Jackson uh, is kind of a double-edged sword. Number one, couldn't win games without him, so you couldn't get to the playoffs. But the fact is, he showed his value, how valuable he is when he's healthy, by the fact that when he wasn't feeling very good and when he was out of the lineup, they're not winning games. So I think originally the Ravens had hoped that the 2021 season would provide clarity for what they were going to do with with, uh, Lamar Jackson long term. The problem comes in when you, uh, because I believe that the Ravens really kind of wanted to see Lamar Jackson be a better playoff player. Mm -hmm. Lamar Jackson has played uh, four playoff games he's lost three of them he's not played really well in any one of them he's a 56 percent passer i believe in those games uh you know a lousy passer rate he just hasn't played well so the question has always been and the ravens are dispassionate when it comes to paying veteran players Mm -hmm. if they don't pay them Somebody else does. They just trust that the compensatory draft picks and the intelligence of their scouting department, that they'll find a successor to whoever it is. They've done it for years and years with particularly with really good defensive players and and pass rushers. They just don't pay those guys. Mm -hmm. They build up more guys through their farm system and it's worked overall pretty well. Now, would it work for a quarterback? I don't know. Probably not because quarterbacks are a different breed. Obviously, Mm -hmm. you know, the bust factor is very high and they struck gold with the last pick in the first round in 2018 with Lamar Jackson. Question is now, if you pay him right now or this year, you know, the market 
has been set right now. You know, you basically have to pay him in the mid to upper 40 range, even still with those playoff questions hanging over Lamar Jackson's head, you know, because other quarterbacks are getting paid. And, you know, that's those are the contracts that are going to be used. But obviously the unique factor in this and the weird factor in this is that Lamar Jackson doesn't have an agent. And Lamar Jackson represents himself. And it just creates a very, very weird dynamic. And trust me, it's a weird dynamic. It's pretty hard for the general manager of the Ravens, Eric DaCosta, to have, you know, contract discussions with the guy who you publicly are professing all this sort of faith in. Mm -hmm. And privately, you're probably saying to yourself, I mean, do we really want to pay this guy, you know, a jillion dollars uh, when we haven't really seen it in the playoffs? So I don't know. This is a weird one. And like I say, I'm not covering it closely, so I don't know what's happening like on a day to day basis. I expect something will get done, but I just I just don't know. I understand that on a part of the the uh, the organization being cautious. But it seems like Lamar Jackson's not in a rush either. And I look at right. his off the field exploits. Right. He, yeah. he doesn't even have an apparel deal. Like yeah. what what's like I'm trying to get an understanding. <laughs> like, does he not want the money? Is is very unique. <laughs> I you know, William, I Lamar Jackson truly is one of the nicest guys in the NFL. The times I've dealt with him, he always he's very He's a he's a southern kid, you know, he's from Florida. And the times I met with him, he shakes his hand. He goes, hi, Mr. Peter. <laughs> and, and you know, it's like he's very he's very uh, respectful. Mm-hmm. He's very he's he's just he's a really and everybody who knows him says such a, a good person, a good hearted person. And if you see him in that locker room uh, where we haven't been for a couple of years because of covid, but. Mm-hmm. You know, in his first couple of years in the league, he'd go into that locker room. And even though he was just a kid and that was a veteran team, Calais Campbell, uh, you know, who basically could be mayor of Baltimore. Uh, it, it, there are so many veteran players. And 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 yet Lamar Jackson was the nerve center of that locker room. He's so well respected, just a, a good person. And and. I've never had a conversation with him about why don't you get somebody in here to handle all your crap? You know, I I just, so I don't know, but it is a little bit mysterious. You're right about that. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Mr. King in sports, I believe there are individuals who win a championship and then they, they get a pass from like the media, even though they may be underachieving. And I think yeah. one of those individuals is the Baltimore Ravens head coach, John Harbaugh. You know, I think, yes, he won a Super Bowl. But when I look at his whole resume, I feel like he's underachieved. He had one of the greatest linebackers in Ray Lewis. He had one of the greatest safeties in Ed Reed. Uh, the offense has been floundering. Uh, he's fired offensive coordinators, Mark Trestman, Marty Morningway, Cam Cameron. When does, I guess, John Harbaugh get called to the carpet or, or or when is he going to be held accountable for some of the, the floundering that goes on over there in the Ravens squad? Well, when you look at his record, um, I think the way I would look at it is a slightly different way. Mm-hmm. Okay. And that way is they win the Super Bowl and After they win the Super Bowl that year, 2012, you know, which you're right. I mean, that's it's a decade old Mm -hmm. after they win the Super Bowl. uh, John Harbaugh's had only two losing seasons since, but he's also won only two playoff games since. Mm -hmm. But I think the way that the Ravens operate is a lot like the way the Steelers operate, honestly which is uh, we are not going to change coaches unless we feel there is something 
hugely wrong with our situation. Okay. So what the Ravens prefer to do, and you've seen the same thing with the Steelers in the Tomlin era, going back to Bruce Arians and, you know, even this year on the defensive side of the ball, uh, where they parted ways with Keith Butler. Um, And I think when I look at this, okay, the one thing that I keep thinking is that all those years, like when Pittsburgh had Chuck Knoll, and all those years after they won, I'm trying to remember how many years he coached after they won their last Super Bowl, but it was like 12. It was it was quite a few. Mm-hmm. I think what a team like the Ravens sees is that if we get good quarterback play, we're going to contend every year. And if we don't, we're going to look to retool, but we're not going to look to blow it up. And I understand the frustration. I think a lot of Ravens fans are frustrated too. Mm-hmm. Um, but, and, and clearly I was at the playoff game uh, in the 2019 season, they went 14 and two, and then they, they had a terrible game, uh, you know, in that season, in the playoffs, they, they have not played well consistently when it really counted. So I get your frustration, but I think we're in a situation of a little bit like what it was like for one of John Harbaugh's mentors, which is Andy Reid in Philadelphia. They hung on, hung on, hung on after they got to a Super Bowl. Uh, and I think Andy coached that team for nine more years or eight more years. And they won the off season a few times. <laughs> they could, they could never get back to the Super Bowl. So I, I think it's just a reflection of how different people uh, run their organizations. The Ravens believe that uh, John Harbaugh is their guy. And if they get consistent quarterback play, they will contend deep into the playoffs any year they get consistent quarterback play because the rest of the roster is built so well. This is going to be a huge test Mm -hmm. this season, you know, for John Harbaugh, because listen, if you look at the Steelers, Steelers are have many questions specifically around quarterback. You know, the Browns probably are going to be without their quarterback for most, if not all of the season. And uh, the Bengals, I, I, I like the Bengals, but I don't, I'm not positive who they are now. This is a year that I think the Ravens and I would agree that there is going to be some impatience with the Ravens this year if they don't, make a playoff run i was reading some articles and going back to 2018 early in the season there was some insiders saying that the ravens were looking to part ways with harbaugh that year and then that's when lamar jackson went on that six and zero run to finish six and one run to finish the season were they close to parting ways with harbaugh in 2018 not that i know of william i i read some of those things and i'm not I, I'm not as plugged in as, as like a Schefter, but I didn't hear that. I do think that Harbaugh is a little bit of an acquired taste. He can be an emotional guy, um, but what head coach isn't emotional? I mean, and what head coach doesn't go through some ups and downs? I didn't hear that, but that doesn't mean that it's not true. Peter King, I want to go back to that Super Bowl 2000 and uh, took place 2013. It was the 2012 season. It was the Colin Kaepernick led 49ers versus the Joe Flacco led uh, Baltimore Ravens. And it was kind of like the question pocket passer Joe Flacco versus this new hybrid dual threat quarterback in Colin Kaepernick. Like, who was going to win out? And Flacco won that day, the traditional passer. The question was answered that day. Is that still a question in the NFL? Uh, the dual threat quarterback versus the pocket passer has it been answered? Like, where are we? Uh, I don't think the question has been answered. I think if you were to ask me the answer to the question, I would say that the 
either style can win, but I believe, like, if you look at Kyler Murray right now, you know, so I believe that one of the reasons why, not only because of, one of the reasons why the guarantee was light on Kyler Murray is that I think that the Cardinals want to protect themselves in the event that Kyler Murray starts getting hurt. He is a small human being <laughs> and for that position. And, uh, you know, Drew Brees was small too. Russell Wilson's small, but Kyler Murray, uh, I think, and Drew Brees was not, obviously, he was a pure pocket passer. The, the, I think the, uh, the Denver Broncos now want Russell Wilson to be much more of a pocket passer than he has been. And I think he probably will be, but Kyler Murray, he's dangerous in large part because he is so scary as a weapon when he gets out of the pocket. So I think one of the things that I don't know as we sit here right now, because if you if you look at the way the quarterback position is played, there are a lot of teams that want their quarterback to sit in the pocket, to be Tom Brady, to be Peyton Manning, because they don't want them. Even, you know, Tom Brady and Peyton Manning are not athletic at all. You know, they can't run. But I think that there is something about a quarterback who's going to sit in the pocket and is going to make plays from the pocket. You don't necessarily worry about the danger of him getting hurt a lot. Right. So I think you can win in a variety of ways. I just question whether you can win, you know, going back to Steve Young. Steve Young left the game early because of concussions. Yes, sir. And, and a lot of guys who run around a lot have not played deep into their 30s. And so, and look, Troy Aikman left because of concussions too, and he was a statue also. Right. So I don't think there is one way to do it. I think the way to do it is the way that your coach slash offensive mastermind, whoever you've hired for the job, what, who, what that person believes in. Right. Peter King, you mentioned one of my favorite quarterbacks, Russell Wilson. And, you know, I'm just a fan of the sport. It's really hard to assess where guys are as far as quarterback play sometimes. How would you compare the Russell Wilson, who seemed to struggle over the last two years, to the the man that took the Seattle Seahawks to two Super Bowls, winning one? Well, it has been more of a struggle for Wilson, no question about it. But I'm actually writing about Wilson this weekend uh, as we speak because I visited with him uh, Thursday this past week in, in Denver. Uh, you know how uh, the old Mark Twain cliche, the reports of his death have been greatly exaggerated. The reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated. I think Russell Wilson is going to be great in Denver. Not wow. good, great. Wow. He's going to retake his place uh, in the top, whatever the number is, five, <laughs> six, eight quarterbacks in football. There's all different ways to rate him. But, you know, when you think about what has happened to Wilson in the last two years, you know, still think about it. He has been a 67% passer mm -hmm. with a touchdown to interception ratio of 40 of plus 46 uh, with a, a composite rating of 104. Now, any quarterback in football would kill to have a two-year span like that. And what has come out of Seattle is basically that uh, Russell Wilson's on the downside. Mm -hmm. I just, I don't think he is. First of all, I think in Denver, he's going to have a coach who is going to view him more as a peer than as a player. Nathaniel Hackett and he are. Uh, have become close and and here's here's one of the things about Wilson he he's he's just driven he's ridiculously driven mm -hmm. you know he has taken this year and 
uh, every day before practice in training camp. He has gotten his players. You're supposed to be there at eight o'clock at the Denver facility for training camp. So players will, you know, set their alarm in a nearby hotel for uh, whatever, seven, seven o'clock or whatever. Uh, get on the bus, go over to the uh, go over to camp and be there in time for their eight o'clock meeting. Well, Russell Wilson basically wanted his offense to get there at 7 a.m. so that they could do a walkthrough and he would go through every play they were going to run that day in practice so that they would be able to go out and not just have questions about it, but they'd all they'd already be familiar with it and be be certain about each of their roles on the play. That's he's just he doesn't leave anything to chance. Right. And I think now I think he'll have a slightly not, not great but a slightly better offensive line. He's going to have a great running back in Javante Williams. He's going to have a good receiving core. Uh and I think that he's got a chance to be really good. I I expect Russell Wilson's going to have an excellent year. Wow. Wow. I look forward to it. And uh, Denver's actually one of my favorite cities. I was a, a U.S. Army, I was a U.S. Army uh, soldier out in Fort Carson, Colorado, which wow. is about an hour away from Denver. Peter King, do you have a favorite NFL city? Wow. I, I, uh, I like going to Green Bay because I feel like I'm – Back, my favorite show when I was a kid was Leave It to Beaver, okay. and you feel like you're just going back in time uh, with people who just are. They're just happy the Packers are there. Yeah, they might get a little bit angry sometimes at Rogers' antics or whatever, but they're just they're just happy they matter. You know, it's a cool thing to do. But I, I would I would say, you know, the one the one city that I think is a little bit underrated in the NFL that I think is is really a lot of fun to go to uh, and, and to cover a game because it matters so much uh, is Seattle mm -hmm. and just the city itself, a game day, that stadium, the noise, um, their <laughs> their facility is uh on lake washington uh beautiful bucolic area <clears throat> uh a few miles outside of seattle and and every day at training camp you have people coming up you know on you know from lake washington and watching on their boats wow. and it's just it's just a a nice you know a nice place but i mean look so many teams now are spending so much money on these <laughs> new facilities and you go to uh you know you go to some of them and you just you can't believe the resources that are in place chicago's got a beautiful new expanded facility minnesota is just incredible so i don't know i think i i really i enjoy the circuit itself i think yes. there's fun, fun things about every city i saw you and jason gary grab some pizza the other day i forget which city <laughs> that was it was in minneapolis yeah we went to Pizzeria Lola. That that actually was a highlight. I'm on. I'm in the middle of my training camp trip. That was really kind of a highlight uh, because you know you're sitting in a car for six hours with Jason Garrett. There's nothing to do. I'm doing some writing. He takes a nap. He wakes up and he goes, "Hey, anybody want to play a game?" <laughs> and and uh, we all said, "Sure." He said, "Let's play twenty questions." So. We had four rounds of 20 questions over the next, I don't know, hour and a half. Uh, we went to a Dairy Queen in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, which he thought was fun. And then we went to a, a pizza place that I've gone to for a few, the last few years. I go to Minnesota and just, you know, it was fun talking to him about some of the things that uh, that he finds really interesting and and about how you know he knows the scorn that is heaped upon him yeah. in the social sphere and also in Dallas for you know because he never really won as much as people would have wanted him to win and he's just a he's a pragmatic guy who 
the thing about Jason Garrett is, as well as a lot of coaches, look, and players too, they, you know, this is a hard game. Yes. This is a really, really hard game. They try their best. They can't be somebody who they're not. And Josh McDaniels told me a couple of weeks ago in Las Vegas that the one thing he's not going to do this time as a coach is mimic the success that he took out of New England. Mm -hmm. In other words, I'm not going to be Bill Belichick. I'm going to be myself. Well, we'll see. Right. You know, we'll see if he can be. But I think I think most of these coaches and players in this highly, highly competitive business, they try their best, and then you just simply have to let the chips fall. Peter King, uh, the Zoom call is like, give me a counter now. I think uh, I only got like six minutes left. I want to get you out of here in this last question. Can you walk us through what a a Sunday is like for you? I imagine 10 television screens. I imagine your phone blowing up. What's it like? <clears throat> well, William, a few years ago, I think I worked like the first 10 years of uh, NBC in the studio. And so I watched the games in this viewing room uh, with, you know, over the years, a collection of Collinsworths and Dungies and <laughs> and uh, and Harrisons and uh, and a bunch of and Dan Patrick and a bunch of guys, but but now uh, my life is a little bit different. Uh, I concentrate almost exclusively now on this column I write on Monday called Football Morning in America. So I don't, I'm not really. Uh, I do some TV, but not a lot. And so what I do, I'd say once a month, if there's a game that really interests me, I'll get on a plane on Friday and go to that city and, and, you know, cover the game like I did when I worked for Sports Illustrated for 29 years. And then, but now what I do is most days, um, you know, as you know, we, we are Brooklyn residents and I yes, have an apartment in Brooklyn and I have a room in this apartment that I use as my office. So I sit in there and I have the television is on um, is on NFL Red Zone with Scott Hansen. Mm -hmm. The uh, and I have two other screens. One is open to my column so I can take notes and, and write things for my column as I watch games. And my second screen is on whatever game I'm most interested in in that window, either the early window or the late window. Then uh, after the first game, uh, I'll pick out four or five things that happen, uh, say midway or early in the fourth quarter. I'll either text a player or coach who I'd like to talk to if he gets a minute after the game or um, I'll text the, uh, the PR guy for the team and say, Hey, can you, uh, see if you can get whoever to, to call me for eight minutes after the game. Right. And so that's kind of how I do. It. And I do the same thing after the late games, the problem becomes, uh, when this big story of the day happens in the Sunday night game, <laughs> and then you think that you have a really good handle on what you're going to write and what you put in the column. And then all of a sudden, holy crap, you go into a fire drill and it's 1245 AM and you've got uh, somebody on the phone uh, from that late game. I, it happened last year with uh, <clears throat> the Ravens rookie Odafe Owe, who, uh, um, and I know I'm mispronouncing his name, but it happened uh, after he made a couple of big plays late to help the Ravens win a game. And so I just I tore up the column at one o'clock in the morning <laughs> and just wrote something different on the top of the column because we like to get the column out by about 430 uh, a.m. to make sure that, you know, when people are waking up, a lot of people will read my column For like sure. before they go to work or maybe uh you know early in the day at work so you just you try to get you try to service people and go to where they are and um so but that's that's kind of a tip, typical day and and then uh you know essentially you know I spend the first two or three days of the week 
trying not to answer the phone and you know trying to walk my dog and ride my bike in prospect park and do things like that and you know because i used to be owned by this job seven days a week and i'm not anymore i i'm more of a uh uh i'm more of even in season i'm more of a less obsessed person it's <laughs> working out working out a little bit better for me mentally quite there honestly. you go there you go there you yeah. go well, peter king thank you so much forever grateful for your time sir thank you oh you're welcome william good luck and uh have have a uh, have a great great future all right thank you sir ladies and gentlemen i am conducting the biggest interview of my career and i'm looking at a message on the zoom screen and saying you only have 10 more minutes i'm getting stressed like what 10 more minutes and first off, since when? I thought if it was only two people on a Zoom call, you had unlimited time. You only have 10 more minutes. You can upgrade to Zoom Pro. No. <laughs> Luckily, we were able to get that done in the allotted time, though. Uh, uh, again, thank you so much to longtime NFL journalists, uh, one of the best in the business, the great Peter King. And I am going to tell you how I was able to secure Mr. King as a guest a little bit later in the show. But uh, first, I want to go over some of the things him and I discussed. I never introduced the show. This is WBH Radio. I'm your host, William Holly. I want to thank you for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, please hit that like button, drop a comment, subscribe to the channel, and share this video with someone you think would appreciate it. The first topic we discussed was the Deshaun Watson contract. And this was very interesting to me because back in March, he signed five years, $230 million, the most guaranteed money in NFL history. Prior to him, the high mark was Aaron Rodgers at uh, about $150 million. So the Browns and Watson, they, they set the bar $80 million higher. They set a new precedent. And we discussed some of the NFL owners were a little bit annoyed by this. Like, man, now don't you realize my players are going to want the same type of money? So it was. I was waiting to see how it would play out, the contracts that followed Watson. And as Mr. King uh, shared with us, Derek Carr has since signed. He didn't get nearly the same amount of guaranteed dollars. Kyler Murray has just signed. He didn't get nearly the same amount of guaranteed dollars. So the NFL owners were kind of able to I don't want to suppress the market or, or reset the market back to where it was and, and kind of treat the Deshaun Watson contract as an anomaly. I'm sure they were over there sweating bullets like, man, all these players are going to want this Deshaun Watson money. I know if I was a player, I would want it. Oh, y'all gave Watson $230? Well, I need $230 and $1. But somehow the NFL owners were able to, to do it, you know? Um so I not only just watch the sports, I like to watch the business. You know, we thought the Watson contract was going to open the floodgates. All these quarterbacks was going to get north of $230 million, uh, uh, uh guaranteed. And the, the contracts that have come afterwards haven't even gotten close. So if you're on the side of the NFL owners, you got to be high-fiving like, yo, we don't have to start giving up that 230 just yet. That Watson deal is an anomaly. I didn't want to bother Mr. King with uh, Deshaun Watson's legal matters. I'm going to be honest, th that, that story is not of interest to me. To me, the interesting thing that comes out of the whole Deshaun Watson ordeal is the fact that the NFL is still keeping up the charade of them actually caring about people. I mean, what, do you, what are they wrestling with? Whether he should be suspended six games, eight games, a whole season, like... It's really just public relations games that they're trying to do. They don't generally care about victims. They don't generally care about the public or the people. That's my humble opinion. And I would just look at the NFL's history. For those who may not be aware, I want you to go look at, uh, there's a running back for the Cincinnati Bagels. His name is Joe Mixon. I want you to go look at the footage of him in college knocking out one of the co-eds. And that man just threw a touchdown pass in the Super Bowl. 
Kareem Hunt, running back for the Cleveland Browns. I want you to go look at the footage of him kicking a woman in a hotel lobby. And he has the nerve to be disgruntled about his contract. Well, the reason you don't have a contract is because you got cut by the Chiefs after that video came up. So the NFL has a history. These, these guys are going to continue their career. So y'all wrestling with six games or eight games. The, the NFL don't generally care. The NFL is what, 30, 32 owners that are about their money and maintaining their power. That's it. Look at the NFL with Greg Hardy, who was accused of throwing his girlfriend on a bed full of rifles. He was allowed to continue his career. Look at Richie Incognito, who was was heard on the phone, a tape recorder, calling his former teammate a half a nigga. Because the, the guy was mixed, so he wasn't even a full nigga in Richie Incognito's eyes. He was a half a nigga. He was allowed to continue his career. The NFL don't care. Right? And I've come to terms with that. And I no longer condemn them. I just treat the NFL as just entertainment. It's wrestling. It's Ric Flair. Woo! It's Dwayne Rock Johnson on Monday Night Raw. If you smell what the rock is cooking. Right? And I want to ask the audience, what role do we play in... I would say the shenanigans that goes on at this pro level because we continue to feed the fire, stoke the flames where these owners, these players going to do anything they can to win, to include keeping abusers on the staff, on the roster, overlooking things, right? They don't generally care about the public. And again, I'm, I'm not mad because again, I came to grips with that. These guys are just... Entertainers, they in it for money and power. I no longer look to these individuals as gods and deities and I'm naming my kids after them and heroes. Nah. So to the fan base, I would ask you, when you're unhappy about certain people being on the field, I would ask you to to examine what role do we play in that? Because really, no matter what they put out there, we still showing up on Sundays, we still buying jerseys, we still playing fantasy football. So my, not, my eye is no longer directed at the NFL. They've shown me who they are, and I believe them. I'm looking at the fans. What role do we play in that? Creating this environment where individuals are willing to do whatever they can to win. Because that's where the money and power is. Uh, what else did we discuss? Lamar Jackson. Lamar Jackson and his business dealings. You know, he's electric on the field. I love watching him. His business dealings, to me, are just as interesting. And Peter King described it as mysterious. Because this time last year, he said, yo, I'm too focused on football to be worried about a contract. (laughs) And right now, it still doesn't seem to be a level of urgency on his part to get the deal done. And people are like, yo, Will, you crazy, dog. I got to go get that bag. But. Look at his off-the-field business dealings. The only deal I've ever seen him sign was for Oakley Shades. Lamar Jackson is one of the most electrifying people in the NFL. He doesn't have an apparel deal. Lamar Jackson is a Heisman Trophy winner. Lamar Jackson is a unanimous NFL MVP. And he doesn't have an apparel deal. No Nike, no Adidas. When he plays in Baltimore, the home of Under Armour. And they like to bring up that he's self-represented and that him and his moms are handling their own business. Well, okay. But there have been many players that are self-represented. Richard Sherman, DeAndre Hopkins, Russell Okung, uh, uh, Jacoby Brissett. That doesn't mean they can't get a deal done just because it's him and his mom. I really start to question if he wants a deal. Because it's not just the NFL contract. It's the fact that he doesn't have an apparel deal. And you might say, Will, what are you talking about he don't want the deal? In the words of the late great ghetto poet, Christopher Wallace, a.k.a. Biggie Smalls, more money, more problems. 
It's like the more money we come across, the more problems we see. B I G P O P P A. No info for the D E A. Perhaps Lamar Jackson is hesitant because he knows more money, more problems. Perhaps he is content where he is right now. He got his own website where he's doing his own clothing. You know, he has his his football camp that he does in his area that where he wants to do it. Maybe he's not ready to take on the sneakers, the $200 million LFL contract. Because when you get that money, your phone start ringing different. I always make fun of Tiger Woods because he stepped out on his wife. He had all these dalliances with women other than his wife. And Nike put him behind a podium and made him apologize to you. Hold on. He, he cheated on his wife and he, he got to apologize to the public? Nike put out a co- commercial with his deceased father scolding him and counseling him. Huh? He, he cheated on his wife. He, he don't owe anything to us. But that's what happens when you have these endorsements when you have other people subsidizing your career you belong to them so maybe Lamar Jackson is not in a rush to do that you know we look at his social media he's popping up at random parks playing with the kids he want to play with maybe he's at peace you see you start signing big deals people calling your phone "Uh, Lamar Jackson we need you to do a football camp in uh, Anchorage Alaska He might be like, nah. But Will, what if he gets hurt? If he gets hurt right now, they're probably going to franchise tag him. You know what? Let's let's take a fly on Lamar Jackson. He tore his Achilles or whatever. But let's just put him on a franchise tag. See how he rehabs. Like, because there's too much talent there. We we can't give up on that. We we got to see it again. And if he has an amazing year, they still might franchise tag him. Franchise tag is, I believe, it's a, a one-year contract, and you get paid a salary that's uh, an average between the top five quarterbacks in the league, something like that. So I just find Lamar Jackson's business dealings very interesting. You know, when Cam Newton came out of college, he had one of the biggest deals from Under Armour. When Reggie Bush came out of college, he had one of the biggest deals from Adidas. Lamar Jackson was the last quarterback taken in the first round. Okay, cool. Maybe maybe, uh, the sneaker companies weren't knocking on his door. But look where he is now. He's a Heisman Trophy winner. He's a unanimous MVP. He was on the cover of Madden. He he is one of the most electrifying players in the NFL. He still don't have a sneaker deal. See, I don't just look at the contract, the NFL contract, or, or lack thereof. In a, in a vacuum, I pair it with the fact that he hasn't done much dealings away from the field. I find that very interesting. And it makes me wonder if he really wants it. And if he doesn't, that's fine. Maybe he's not ready for that. Because as I said, like more money, more problems, like Biggie said. Maybe he ain't ready to sign up for that. Maybe he's content with the life that he has right now. As he learns more business, as he matures. And then maybe down the line, he'd be ready for that 200 or whatever. So, again, I just find that uh, very interesting. So let me tell you how. How many followers I got on Instagram right now? 50? How many I got on Twitter? I don't know. Maybe less than that. How somebody with my standing was able to secure the great Peter King. As he mentioned, we're both Brooklyn residents, right? So one day, I can't even remember the day. I think it was early this year. I was getting ready to attend an event at the Barclays Center. I'm circling, circling. I find parking. I find me a parking spot. I sit for a minute. Who do I see coming up the block with his dog, Peter King? I'm like, yo, dog, that's the great Peter King. So I jump out. I'm like, I'm I'm waving. Like, he's on the phone. Like, Peter King, I get a second, like. And he says, yeah, I'm a, I'm a circle of block. Now, I felt bad about bothering him. He's on the phone. Who knows? He might have been on the phone conducting a podcast. So 
I, I didn't wait for him to circle the block. I said, you know what, Will, that man's walking his dog. Just, just leave him, son. So I went about my day, went to the Barclay Center. Months later, at a different location in Brooklyn, I'm walking, and who do I see walking in the opposite direction? Peter King. So we, we walk past one another. I say, hey, Mr. Peter King. He says, hello. And as I'm walking by him, I'm starting to have that conversation in my head. Like, yo, well, son, like this is your opportunity. This is your second time seeing him. It's got to be a sign, man. Like, yo, bro, just, just go in, man. Ask me to do a podcast. So I, I turn around, take a deep breath. I say, Mr. King. My name is William Holly. I'm a U.S. Army veteran. I got a doctorate of education from East Tennessee State University. I host a podcast called WBH Radio. I've had great guests like Skip Bayless and Armin Katayan. How would you feel about joining me? He said, podcast? He said, I'm going on vacation for the next four or five weeks. Send me an email after that, and we'll get it done. And sure enough, I waited till those five weeks were up. I sent him an email, and he responded. And what you see, uh, it just played out. You know what I'm saying? Like, he, he's a man of his word, and he was here. And I find that very interesting. For people who, who, who may not have been around people with such high standing or celebrities, you know, not only do I do the podcast, and I've had great guests like Peter King and Skip Bayless and Rob Parker, but I drove limousines in New York City for years. I've been with some of your favorite celebrities, actors, uh, musicians, athletes. Uh, I've been with wealthy people, bankers, entrepreneurs, whatever. And I'm going to be honest. Like, some of the people that do it at the highest, the highest levels, they, they have certain habits. And being a person of their word, being on time, is, is who a lot of them are. You know, and, and, and I believe it's those habits that make people successful. It's, it's not a coincidence is what I'm trying to say. It's not a coincidence. I wrote a piece about Brett Yarmark years ago. Brett Yarmark used to work at Rock Nation. And I think he's the Big 12 commissioner right now. Every time you send him an email, he's going to respond. Every time you text him, he's going to respond. Every time he says he's going to be somewhere, he's going to be there on time. The same with Skip Bayless. The same with Peter King. And I've been reading this book recently that everybody's been talking about for years, The 48 Laws of Power. Yo, Will, this is how you get it. This is how you attain power. This is how you... And one of the things that stood out to me in that book, it says, only generous souls attain greatness. Huh. When you think of power, you think of an oligarch just devouring everything. Only generous souls attain greatness. So when you think of an individual like Peter King taking his time to, to uh, join a podcast with me who doesn't have nearly the standing. He devoted his time. We recorded that on a Saturday morning. Eight o'clock in the morning. He gave me his time. He gave me his word. He was on time. He was professional. Gave me his energy. Like, it's, it's no secret why individuals like that are successful. I want to tell you the challenge to doing uh, interviews with individuals like Peter King and, and with, with such a high standing and, and such a big platform. With, you know, I'm a fan. I know Peter King because I'm a fan. And when he's on television, I watch. And I'm sure you guys do the same. So I saw him on Rich Eisen. I saw him on Dan Patrick. I saw him on Colin Cowherd. And they've discussed so many different topics. Well, when he comes here, I want to do something that's unique. But it's a challenge because they've discussed so many different things on so many different platforms. So the challenge is to always try to find an angle that you may not hear anywhere else. And you don't want to be too obscure that it, 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 it's, it's a waste of their time. 
You know what I mean? So you try to find that little pocket. And hopefully, I, I, I think we, we were able to do that today. You know, we talked about Deshaun Watson, but not the legal matters, his contract. And uh, the precedent is set and how the owners were able to kind of uh, reset the market. We talked about Lamar Jackson. Everybody talked about him getting a deal done. Getting a deal done, well, let's explore the idea. Maybe he don't even want the deal right now. We talked about John Harbaugh. Everybody says, oh, he's a, a, a Super Bowl winning quarterback. But but what if he's an underachiever? Right? What, what if he's dropped the ball over these years? Like, let's talk about that. I don't know, man. Try my best. Again, William Holly at WBH Radio. Don't forget that, that like button, comment, subscribe, share. I appreciate you tuning in. If you're one of my regulars, if you're a first-time guest because of Mr. Peter King, it's all love, man. We appreciate it. Hope you stick around. Yeah, we out.